If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. And with this, I welcome you cadets here to Fleet Command's History and Current Affairs class to learn about yourself and your enemy, or you won't last long during the nebulous. This campaign is centered around the conflict between our Shelter Alliance and the Breakaway Outlying Systems Protectorate, which is attempting to reassume autonomous control of Elshout's poor, the subregion in which their systems reside. While the current stalemate at the Kribensis Battle Hyperspace Gate remains, there is no action for you hotheads to get blown up in. So Command, in their infinite wisdom, has decided to rotate you back here for some r and and these classes. Since I mentioned the Hyperspace Gate, here is a refresher course for all of you who slept through your Kriegen Duport Portal and Hyperspace vs. Real Space classes at the Academy. Travel through the universe is done via hyperspace, an extremely dangerous and unpredictable other space, which allows ships to transit the massive distances between stars in real space in weeks instead of centuries. While the benefits of such a massive cut in travel time is obvious, the speed of travel comes at a cost. Hyperspace itself is a turbulent mess of intense particle currents and appears as a dense cloudy soup of gas and dust. Its ever-changing shape and limited visual distances make a visual frame of reference impossible, and the intense electrical storms and interference severely inhibit radio signals, making inner ship communications difficult and preventing the establishment of any kind of transponder network except along the most well-traveled of routes. The only solace for navigators is the prevailing currents which flow from the galactic core towards the rim, enabling the determination of a galactic north and the subsequent cardinal directions, and the subtle effect of real space which can be seen in the shapes of the divisions between intense storms and relatively calm areas situated around stars. Penetration of hyperspace from real space is done via quantum explosive device, QEDs, which generate a Kriegen Duport portal for a short time. These generators are usually housed in a torpedo-like device and fired ahead of the ship to keep it safe from the resulting physics calamity. In the early centuries of interstellar travel, ships had roughly even odds of arriving at their destination or being forever lost in the hyperspace with all hands. These derelicts litter hyperspace, though they can be difficult to find, the more daring of the universe's vultures sometimes brave the trip to loot the valuable historical artifacts. Memorials etched with the names of ships lost in route span whole city blocks on almost every world. Fortunately, the mention of the hyperspace gates, massive structures which can stabilize a Kriegen Duport portal indefinitely and provide a protected tunnel link to a receiving gate, brought interstellar travel survival rates up to nearly 100%. These hyperspace gates, often shortened to gates or sometimes referred to as Kriegen Duport gates, serve as anchor points between star systems as a form of interstellar highway. The gates function similar to a warship's standard hyperspace system, utilizing a quantum explosive charge to rip a hole in hyperspace and stabilize a permanent connection between two gates. Hyperspace gates are the safest form of traversing hyperspace itself and are often the centerpiece for battles to take control of a system, though this means these gates are under heavy guard with flotillas, defense stations and even their own contingent of infantry garrisons. Gates are large enough to support a permanent workforce maintaining the gate and this often leads to the development of unique cultures and identities aboard the attached stations. Aside from habitation and storage facilities, gates can also support infrastructure such as bunkerage facilities, repair points and in case of the Pikes' gate, bars. Now on to the stuff you should know, but I will go through this just in case your brain turned too much from all that science talk. Excuse me for a minute, what is it? A development? What do you mean a development? Who is in charge of the gate blockade now? What? <clears throat> Apologies cadets, there is something I have to turn my attention to. Please bring in the political officer, he shall continue this. Ah yes, well as the Major was about to go into. 
Our Shelter Alliance is a federation made up of 26 major populated planets across 17 star systems as well as numerous minor colonies all located within our borders. It is a relatively young entity formed over 400 years ago as a mutual defense pact between three founding systems. This was in response to aggression from the neighboring Venuma coalition and this alliance eventually developed into a full government. While most galactic nations are composed of different cultures within their borders, our alliance is unique on the galactic stage in that it has no core dominant culture. Many of our planets are so different from each other that an outside observer might not believe we all belong to the same nation. Member states of the alliance are mostly autonomous, but alliance-wide policy is created and disseminated by a political body known as the Core Conference or the Core for short. The capital world of the alliance is the Boardman, a large semi-tropical world known for its vast mountain ranges, bright blue oceans and lush jungles. Of special note are the two twin moons of Boardman, Palemon and Nike which can be seen orbiting each other around Boardman. The cities of Boardman are often built into the mountain networks of the world, away from the difficulties of the jungle and secure against the occasional, though heavy, tropic storms. The plant is home to the towering and monolithic administration tower playing host to the core conference and their discussions, as well as the nondescript HQs of the two offices of the Alliance. Indigenous life does exist in the form of beautiful alien birds of paradise, dangerous jungle predators and a vast library of ocean life. Humans are the only intelligent life still found in the Alliance territory and Boardman is no different. The policy of the Alliance is formed by legislators appointed by the individual member governments according to population size. Some politicians argued that the weak association between the members, with no strong central authority, is a recipe for disaster down the line, but the last four centuries have proven them wrong, so far. The ease of relocation between plants and changes of citizenship for those who are not content where they are, combined with the difficulty of rigid administration across interstellar space without strong forces, has left this faction as one of the Alliance's minor parties. All members contribute to the common defense of the Alliance borders by providing ships and crews for the combined fleets. For most of the Alliance's history, member states have provided their own fleet ships of indigenous design and the crews to man them. Most Alliance crews were not integrated between planets, with most spacers, at least those not working at the fleet command level, spending their entire careers serving with only people from their home world or system. The challenge of managing the repairs, shipyard schedules, modernization plans and parts inventories for the slew of different ships left many a depot commander burnt out after only a year and strained fleet logistics continuously. It was only in the last 150 years that our Navy Fleet Command undertook a standardization initiative and commissioned the design of a set of warship hulls across all the core ship classes to reduce these logistic challenges. These new hulls have steadily replaced the older mixed designs as they have reached the end of their useful lives. While it is still not uncommon to see unique designs in the fleet, these are becoming the past, not the norm. The Alliance Navy fleet itself is at the forefront of the Alliance, operating as the most recognizable branch of the Alliance military. While primarily a military force, Fleet Division also functions in a civilian role by protecting the necessary infrastructure and enforcement for Alliance-wide space travel and space security. Fleet Division holds themselves in high regard as their professionalism and countless honors have given them a sterling reputation. The Division tends to have the most numerous personnel tasked with securing Alliance space and laying the infrastructure for Alliance expansion, which may include light diplomatic roles. While the fleet's mission priority centered around space naval warfare, 
the fleet can also serve in a terrestrial role, constructing bases for exospheric spacecraft such as the Alliance's Claymore, temporary spaceports and sometimes naval supply stations. Fleet division colors consist of a bone white base color with gold striping or an olive drab base color with bone white striping. The headquarters is the Alliance Naval Office. Unlike the Marine Division, the fleet does not have strict separation of specialized personnel. Instead, the fleet is organized into malleable task forces, or tasks in fleet jargon, that are typically arranged for a single mission type. I hope that you have found all this familiar and just a refresher course so we can move over to the subject of the outlying systems protectorate. They started as a minor political faction within our own alliance government, but now the Protectorate is a single entity consisting of eight worlds across three systems. The Outlying Systems Protectorate, or OSP for short, is considered one of the oldest constituent entities in the alliance and lies on the furthest three world edge of the alliance space, away from any other border. Their distance from inter empire borders, trade, and conflict have left the OSP system an afterthought in many alliance dealings and they were rarely patrolled by official military elements. Depending more on each other than the seldom assistance of the alliance, the Protectorate practices the timeless idea of succeeding through one's own perseverance. While it is certain that no one on the galactic stage refers to the alliance as culturally homogeneous, the OSP's relative isolation and combined history has resulted in the cluster retaining much of its internal loyalties and often operating as a unified front in alliance politics. Their sense of self-reliance has garnered an identity as outsiders to the rest of the alliance worlds, and protectorate leadership is more than happy to maintain this image as it benefits their goals of independence. It is widely known that the protectorate views the alliance as stale and no longer necessary as the external threats it was originally founded to counter have since shifted significantly. In their view, they provide far more to the Alliance than they receive back in benefits and seek to return to a fully autonomous nation. Due to the geography of the Alliance and the difficulty of hyperspace travel without access to the gates, political pundits often remarked that the OSP simply wants to avoid paying their share while exploiting the protection the Alliance provides them simply by being a physical barrier from the rest of the populated galaxy. The OSP's worlds are entirely self-sufficient in terms of food and common resource production, but they lack the high-level manufacturing of the core worlds. In spite of this, their resourcefulness and solidarity can be seen in their fleet. What they lack in major shipyards, they make up for in creative appropriation of retired alliance vessels as well as retrofitting freighters and mining haulers. Their fleet doctrines rely heavily on the use of their retrofitted civilian ships as brawlers, able to throw a punch but not take one. In such large numbers they exploit and overwhelm the more methodical tactics of the alliance navy, while reserving their few proper warships for command and control. The humbly named Protectorate Navy serves as the first line of defense for the Protectorate's territory. Lacking the access to standardized naval warships, the OSPN was forced to rapidly mobilize and commandeer a vast amount of freighters, mining vessels and various civilian grade ships to fill out the gaps of their naval roster. A handful of outdated museum ships function as their command and control vessels, but even while obsolete, these designs can be just as deadly as many of the Alliance's current designs. The OSPN consists mostly of volunteer captains who have some naval experience, but most have been career captains of freighters and bulk carriers. Despite this, the freighter fleet of the OSP is known to be a threat even to a standard Alliance task force, and some of these captains show surprising initiative. However, the OSPN's use of civilian converted warships has drawn considerable criticism both within and from the outside of OSP as the Battle Rebellion use of similar tactics leading up to the Harper incident has placed a serious black mark on the OSP's doctrine. The OSPN works directly with respected bulwark heavy industries producing modified designs of vessels deemed tactically efficient and manufacturing freighters required for the OSP's war machine. 
Mining barges, rock haulers, liquid tankers, every ship is a potential war asset and the OSP is quick to commandeer these ships in the name of defense, but it can often raise tensions with civilians and companies. The OSPN colors are a base color of navy blue and orange striping. Alternative colors may also involve a gray base color with orange striping. The headquarters is the hotel. The insidiously named department is the OSP's equivalent of the naval office, providing the protectorate with their own technological advancements and designs to further the protectorate's fleet. While the OSP doctrines favor rearming and refitting of civilian class vessels, this does not stop the Atel from producing their own brand of chaotic firepower that has come to oppose the weapons of the Alliance. Regarded as secretive, close-fisted and instinctual, the Atel is known for their often unpredictable development breakthroughs that rival that of the Alliance. Similar to the naval office, the hotel designs warships and weaponry, while the actual manufacturing process is left to the OSP's contracted shipyards and corporations. Now it is time to get familiar with the three core systems making up the OSP. Also known as the outlying systems, Elshut Spur is widely regarded as the sovereign territory of the OSP and by extension the Alliance, containing Battle, Rolklaren and Pyxis along a scattering of uncharted systems. The Spur is one of the oldest clusters in the Alliance corner of space and has become a location of almost legendary repute for its vast mineral and precious metal deposits to be found in the Eight Ball Belt. Although facing a growing infestation of pirates, Alshut Spur is a relatively peaceful region of the Alliance, at least until the Battle Rebellion began. Now the system is a war zone for both the OSP and the Alliance, ripping apart the nearby systems to fuel their war effort. The largest of the OSP systems, Battle, is a titan of industry and hosts a number of local manufacturers, stations and service facilities that service the populated majority of Elshut Spur. Battle is unique in that nearly all of the worlds in that system are habitable, though not all are actually settled and their environments vary dramatically, a perfect combination for research, mining and even commerce. Battle forms the pivot of the V-shaped OSP territory, serving as the link between Pyxis, Rokladen and the rest of Alliance space through its hyperspace gate to Kripensis. This geography makes Battle the gatekeeper of the OSP, a fact that is being capitalized on by both factions. The Battle of Rebellion has made this even more of a crucial factor on the strategic level, as the potential loss of battle for the OPS will allow the Alliance to cut their territory in half and isolate the remaining systems from each other. The system of Roklaren is the OPS economic and naval hub, hosting the largest concentration of mining guilds, corporate stations and the largest shipyard under the Bulwark Heavy Industries name. Roklaren was struck with a gold rush when prospecting probes detected an asteroid field rife with heavy and rare metals hidden in a dark nebula, now known as the Heartbreak Cloud. For some, Roklaren could be seen as the real source of power for the OSP, but the lack of habitable worlds means the majority of power and infrastructure still lies within Pyxis. On the military stage, Roklaren's position in the Battle of Rebellion is a double-edged sword. Roklaren has the means to perform a rapid triple R for the OSP fleets and a bottleneck for the Battle of Roklaren gate, but should the Alliance take control of battle, this will put the OSP's largest ship manufacturing facility at even higher risk. Regarded as the seat of power for the OSP conclave, Pyxis lies the furthest from the Alliance overall, set deep in the inhabited area of the Elshut Spur. Pyxis is host to the tropical ring capital world of Black Sands, where the OSP manages their sovereignty and the bulk of corporations make their headquarters. The space about Pyxis is snaked around by a bright and winding nebula, forming scenic views and a natural defensive layer for the entirety of the system. The Kribensis system is not part of the OSP, but it is its gateway. Known mostly for the bright wolf rainet star that dominates the system, spilling light through the shattered asteroid fields of the system. Clouds of ionizing gas litter and threaten any vessel passing through the extremely high EMP radiation. 
The hazards posed in the system provide a safe harbor for pirate clans and criminals hiding away in bases attached to the ever-moving asteroids. Kribensis consists of a single habitable world, Corvallis, now left abandoned following the Harper incident. With the start of the Battle Rebellion, the Alliance has begun using Kribensis as a naval master point, setting up small outposts and stations to begin their push through the single Kribensis battle gate, and finally establish a foothold in battle. This is made far more difficult with the system's hazards and the constant hunt for pirates attempting to ambush freighter convoys or lone Alliance vessels. An infamous pirate crew operating from the safety of the 8 ball belt and Kribensis, the Sevens came into existence during the Harper incident as a result of abandoning refugees harboring an immense distrust towards Alliance core conference following their hasty and fumbled withdrawal from the system. It is widely believed that the Sevens gained their strength from scavenging strained remains of civilian and military vessels cannibalizing parts and hull sections to forge their own venerable fortresses of war, sailing open space to prey upon helpless vessels for a living. Despite their prominence in the Alshut Spur, the Sevens employ clever tactics and techniques to hide their home port, Shuba Base, from the prying eyes of the OSP and the Alliance. The Sevens are considered one of the greatest mistakes of the Alliance, directly stemming from their inability to mitigate the aftershocks of the Harper incident, leading to a growing blight upon the Spur. Since I have already mentioned the Battle of Rebellion and Harper incident, we might as well start at the beginning, the Guild Riots. While not a direct cause of the Battle of Rebellion, the Guild Riots were spurred on by the lack of infrastructural support from a supply-stretched alliance, resulting in alarming high numbers of casualties from mining accidents. The exhausted core conference's apathetic apology only brought harsh criticism from major contractors and civilians, especially as it was made evident that the alliance could simply not spare the resources to improve the Guild situation only asking for higher and higher production quotas to meet the Alliance's needs. This inevitably reached a climax when increasingly frustrated miners destroyed a communication satellite with mines mass drives. This prompted immediate action from the Alliance peacekeepers and the strike turned into a full-blown riot. Though the riot itself only lasted for two days in standard time, Countless tons of precious metals and materials were destroyed or looted by the time the riots were quelled and a heavy blow was dealt to the Alliance's manufacturing power, the effects of which are still felt today. The Divide, or more commonly the Harper Incident, was the long weak conflict that culminated in the beginning of the Battle Rebellion. After decades of rising tensions between the Protectorate and the rest of the Alliance, a group of OSP extremists Delusioned by what they viewed as the Protectorate's weak will and inability to stand up to the Alliance, seized control of the ANS Open Flame, a Rainer's class frigate docked with the Samedi mining station in the 8 ball belt for a brief port visit, by storming its airlock and killing the small contingent of crew left on board. Before word could spread, they had infiltrated the Kribensis system and detonated the ship's reactor in close proximity to the Harbor Fund Agriculture Station, over the Alliance-controlled colony world of Corvallis. As a station critical to the development of the colony, its destruction led to the abandonment of Corvallis and an outcry of condemnation from both the Alliance's constituents and the Protectorate's representatives. This gave the Alliance, fearful of further actions, a legal justification to mobilize what they could of their searched fleet to blockade the Kribensis battle gate leading into Elshut Spur and effectively cutting off the Protectorate's three systems. However, with the extreme self-sufficiency of the OSP systems, the blockade could have gone on for years before the Protectorate could feel any kind of strain. Instead, the radical elements in the battle government decided that the blockade provided the perfect impetus to declare the OPS independence. Representatives from the other two systems in the OSP, Pyxis and Roclaren, frantically urged restraint behind the scenes but were unwillingly swept along as the tensions escalated out of control in a place they had no direct influence over. In an attempt to let cooler heads prevail, the leaders of Pyxis and Roclaren sent an envoy through the Kribensis Battle Hyperspace Gate to negotiate a ceasefire, but their efforts backfired. 
due in part to Battle's aggressive rhetoric over the previous weeks and the fact that OSP was notorious for using retrofitted civilian ships as combatants, the Envoy's ship was identified as a blockade runner by human error on board the lead blockade ship, the cruiser ANS Conclusion Absolute, and quickly destroyed by a missile strike. This triggered a domino effect across the system and with tensions at all-time high, the conflict soon boiled into a shooting war, the first of its kind in over 75 years. In response, Battle mobilized every naval asset available and instituted a counter-blockade of the gate to Kribensis in order to buy them time to fortify their position. They then began a pre-planned rapid force build-up by issuing a call for all civilian ships over 5,000 tons to report to the Setfield, Blackwall and Yamatsuto shipyard for retrofit. Those that did not comply were seized using emergency war powers with the crews rotated for battle zone crews to take command. Lastly, battle forces took control of a decommissioned museum battleship in orbit over Gog Yuen, the ANS strong the route beneath and began rapidly preparing it for service. The only remaining Alliance loyal warship in the system when the gate was blockaded was the ANS Swift Toxin, another Rainer class frigate. Her captain had assumed the Separatists would attempt to recommission the antique warship, knowing the damage it could cause if it was able to augment their otherwise ragtag fleet, and had proceeded directly to Gong Yuen orbit when events began escalating. Unfortunately, the Separatists had been able to transfer enough ammunition on board by the time the Toxin arrived that it was unable to stop them from getting the ship underway. The frigate sustained heavy damage and was forced to withdraw. The locations of the Toxin and route are currently unknown. This sets the stage for the Battle Rebellion. The only hyperspace gate into Elshut Spur is blockaded from both sides. Roklaren and Pyxis are refusing to commit their own forces, while Battle tries to draw them into supporting the conflict. A lone Alliance warship is trapped behind enemy lines, and the core conference sees this conflict as the harbinger of the dissolution of the Alliance that must be stopped. Considered by many to have started immediately following the Harbor incident, the Battle Rebellion is the ongoing conflict between the Alliance, the OSP and the Battle Barony. Following the incident, Battle took complete control of the Setfield, Blackwall and Yamatsuto shipyards along with nearly every military weight ship present in the system. The Rebellion then commenced a blitz capture of all three gates, quickly seizing Battle Kribensis, Battle Pyxis and the Battle Rakhlaren gates effectively cutting off the OSP and the Alliance from the majority of Elshut Spur. This action was helmed by both Cordova's and Gogwin's barons, Quintus Quinn Raid and Sam Garnier. So far, the conflict has reached a standstill as battle has bottlenecked their system and its self-reliance means that it could go years without outside support. Battle considers itself at war with both the OSP and the Alliance putting itself into a three-way conflict that could last for years. They used the barony blue base color with many different trims depending on the baron who equipped the ships. Sometimes they will even use the generic protectorate orange. All of this has left us in a precarious position and a standoff no one wants to break but all know must be broken at some point. Both the Alliance and the OSP feel they are fighting defensive wars, though both state different justifications typically stemming from the Harper incident. The Alliance wants to secure their stretch domain and to eventually incorporate the OSP back into their fold to refuel the demanding economy and industry, while the OSP aims to completely cut ties with the Alliance and establish more territory for their rapidly growing population. While the Alliance's size would be enough to intimidate the OSP into capitulation, the Alliance's recent infrastructural troubles have left the fleets disorganized and supply lines stretched to their limit, something the OSP is keen to exploit. Among this, the Alliance, now feeling the effects of 400 years of stagnation and the lack of an external threat it was originally made to combat, is beginning to fracture and the core conferences, aghast with how easy the OSP can withdraw from the Alliance, is adamant that the succession is a harbinger of the Alliance's fall and believes that this must not be allowed to continue, lest more systems move for independence. And that would be all for now, cadets. Dismissed.